Hello, um, welcome to our next broadcast on the Plan Talk. Um, today we're actually covering a really interesting subject, which I think is really important that we start to grapple with as an industry, um, which is around how AI is going to change the decision-making process and what, what we need to think about as planners as we head into this space. So um, Dr. Sue Chadwick is going to speak to us today. Um, Sue works at Pinsent and Masons and does lots of the um, advising um, and supporting lawyers in the planning space. Um, you may have seen some of the work that Sue's done elsewhere um, as well. So Sue, I'm gonna hand over to you, um, but before I do, um, there's two things. Firstly, um, the, the format of this, for anyone who hasn't attended any of our events before, is that it's about a 15-minute presentation followed by Q&A. Second point is if you've got questions, and believe me, you will have questions about this, um, on that side of the screen, I think, um, is a space to write your questions. Please do so, and I'll group them together and ask them in the second part of it. And then um, the, the, the third message is any questions we don't get to, we'll pass on to Sue and ask her kindly to kind of jot a few notes for us to come back to you on afterwards. So over to you, Sue. Thanks, David. I um, very much appreciate the opportunity to get my thoughts out there because I've been looking at plan tech for quite a long time now, and AI is probably the most interesting part of it. So, taking us back to 1947, um, Alan Turing gave an, a lecture to the Mathematical Society and he introduced something he called the automatic computing engine. This was at a time when computers were actually um, data, human data inputters, and he was talking about automating that function. And he said that he was being a real visionary. And he said that we will need a number of efficient librarian types to keep us in order because he could see that this the use of computing technology would proliferate and that eventually it would need its own regulatory framework. And of course, as planners, we all know that in the same year, the great Town and Country Planning Act 1947 was also made. And it is very much still the basis on which we see planning. Um, it required development proposals to be considered by de balancing development plan policies and material considerations against each other. It required local authorities to have their own development plans. Pretty much everything we see today had its origins there. And now we're in 2020, and amazingly, we're at the point where the two worlds are converging for the first time. AI is already being used in planning decisions or small, at least small parts of them and is likely to do much more in the future. And although computers and computing technology has evolved to an enormous extent since 1947, sadly, and this was a point that Ewan was making at his talk yesterday, um, planning really hasn't. We are still stuck in a, a sort of an analogue 1947 way of thinking about planning. So this is the time really to think about what AI is and what we can do about it. And I thought about it from a planning point of view and I thought, you know what, it's a bit like sustainable development. People use it all the time and it's such a general term because it can, can describe such a wide range of concepts. Um, and to give you an idea, it's basically the word that you use when a computer does anything that human intelligence could otherwise do. And it can be as simple as when you're, you know, you're buying something online and, and the form automatically gets completed with all of your address and personal details. And you think, well, that's nice. You don't have to do that job. That's AI. On the other hand, there's a research project at the moment on at the Turing, which is um, modeling synthetic population simulation through time. So it's predicting populations through time. And one of the aims of that project is to inform section 106 asks and predictions. Um, it can already be used in planning processes. Um, Ewan talked about 
uh, planning chatbots. And I think Redbridge, I've spoken to Brett Leahy recently, Redbridge are using those sort of things or experimenting with them. And also I wanted to mention Alistair Parvin and the PlanX project, where they are also automating um, validation of planning. So it's already being used in planning processes and it is already being used in planning decisions in other ways. An enormous amount of our ecological data, the sort of stuff that goes into EIAs and SEAs, is already being automated. And this is all brilliant, but it does bring up a number of issues. And I'm sorry, it's, it's always the lawyer's job to say, but what if? And these are the what ifs when it comes to automation. Firstly, accountability. If your decision has been partly made on the basis of a computer's, if you like, predictions, then it isn't an entirely human made decision. And who in the end has responsibility for it? And obviously in local government, transparency is absolutely key. Similarly, if you've used what they call a black box algorithm, which is one where you can't quite explain how the computer's come to the decision it's come to, then how can you challenge the conclusions if you're a member of the public? There's a transparency issue there. And we're all familiar with the, the law and case law about reasons. Now, again, if a decision has been made partly or wholly by a black box technology, how can a decision maker, a human decision maker, fully justify the decision? Discretion, huge area in planning. If that um, officer or that committee has simply relied on information that's been generated by an algorithm, a black box algorithm, has that function been delegated correctly? And if that wasn't enough, there are emerging and growing issues to do with human rights and equalities that are specifically connected with the use of AI. And again, as planning, as planning um, practitioners, we're always aware of just how important those issues are for planning decisions and the negative consequences of ignoring them. And although most local authorities haven't even started using AI, those that have, the academics are, I'm afraid, already arguing that if the required safeguards do not exist, then a public body lacks a lawful basis for a decision based on AI. Now, most of them are currently looking at the way um, local authorities are using AI in healthcare, and that's a big issue at the moment with the, the um, tracing apps that are all emerging globally. But the paper that says that was one by uh, Marion Oswald, and that was quoted in the report from the Committee on Standards in Public Life that brought out its report um, earlier this year. It kind of got lost um, because of all of the um, other events that took over global news after that. But it also said public bodies are introducing AI into service delivery without a clear understanding of the requirements of the law. There are a number of recommendations in that report, many of them for government, but some of them for local bodies generally saying, you know, get your policies in order, get your decision making in order, or this will become an issue without you even being aware of it. And I think there are two basic risks that could be um, emerging if we do grasp AI and start using it in planning decisions. The first one is the obvious one. People think this is just too big and too complicated. I can't possibly start using this, this new technology. I don't understand it. I can't explain it to my members. I can't explain it to the public. Let's just leave it and hope that it goes away or somebody younger takes it on. That's certainly my initial reaction when I started looking at this. And I think the second risk is that somebody approaches you with a whizzy new app and shows you all the ways that it could save time and money and you adopt it. And then only six months later, realize you've got cybersecurity risks or it doesn't talk to your existing tech. Or worst of all, some hungry lawyer is out there and has read Marion Oswald's paper and has read the committee's um, report and says this is an invalid decision. Um, and certainly the courts don't know enough about it. They, would, they may not legitimize the challenge, but they would certainly hold things up and you would be involved in time and delay and cost while they looked at the issue generally. 
So there are some risks, but I think there are also some real opportunities now for doing quite easy things that would get around these risks and if you like de-risk the new the use of the new technology and I, these are all options you could do them all you could do one of them um, you could if you had an authority wide awareness of ai the whole authority could adopt a policy for how you use it what you use it for what the risks are how they can be mitigated that's obviously the safest approach because it gives you a top level policy to rely on. One of the things I'm working on at the moment is, a, is what I'm calling a risk matrix. So I'm looking at each different AI technology and looking at the specific risks that it involves. Because if you've got a very simple algorithm, actually you've got a very low risk of anything being a problem because you can explain it. If you've got a higher risk technology and there's a huge range within AI, then you have specific risks depending on what you're using it for and what kind of an algorithm it is. You can have specific mitigations too. You could also have a protocol for procuring AI. That means when you buy that WYSI app, you ask the right questions so that the people who are supplying the app have to deal with things like cybersecurity and inequalities and um, interoperability. And you're to a certain extent protected by having the right procurement processes and the right contract clauses. And if none of that's happening, then at least think about some simple planning guidance on how you are or are not going to use AI in planning decisions and what the individual issues are. And if you had one or more, or ideally all of those things in place, then when you get to your individual planning decision, just as you would with equalities, rather than flounder around trying to explain things, You'd be able to show that you were aware of the risks, that you'd mitigated those risks, and that your decision was a reasonable one based on it. Just as we, I would love to say, just as we did for equalities, but actually this is what happened with equalities. In 2010, they came in to the agenda. We all kind of ignored them. And it was only when we had two or three high profile cases that we had things like equalities impact assessments brought in. So what I'm saying is why not start now with AI, start grasping the issues and start mitigating them now. And I'm saying that because this is not a problem, this is a huge opportunity. We are already having our lives disrupted by technology. I wouldn't be sitting here talking to everyone without it. And it's only going to proliferate. Trying to stop that or work without it is a waste of resources. Just as Turing saw, it was a waste of resources to have a whole load of clever people in a room inputting data when a machine could do it. And there are huge public benefits that could be accessed by using AI in a responsible way. Planning has been through many changes since 1947. The digital revolution is disrupted, dis disrupt, but it's just an evolution of existing issues. I um, read last year um, Ebenezer Howard's book, um, Garden Cities of Tomorrow. People talk about that as you know, introducing green and leafy suburbs, but it, it does. But he also talks about the new technologies that are coming through, and in his case, it was the railway. And he is so keen to make sure that planning takes advantage of this new railway technology. We should see that this is part of what planning does and not resist it. Um, because you know all the planners I know are enthusiastic and creative. There is no reason why we shouldn't be optimizing tech for the best human good and the least possible human harm. And I'm going to leave my last thoughts to Mr. Turing himself, um, a visionary in many ways, and um, I think this is probably the most appropriate way to end the, um, the talk that I've got. We can only see a short distance ahead but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. Thank you. Now, how do I click this? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sue. Um, if you stop sharing your screen, that, that was really insightful presentation. Thank you. Um, in actual fact, I think uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reading where you get to on this because I think there's so many interesting challenges. You're, sh you're still sharing your screen. I think there's a stop sharing button. Just in case you accidentally show us all your emails or something. Um, no, it's all right. 
<laughs> that, that, so we've got some really kind of interesting questions. Um, and I think that the first one that really kind of comes to me um, and to group them together is much more around where do you think this is going to go? How far through the planning system do you think it's going to go? And where do you think it will kind of, nat do you think there's a point it will naturally balance out? Yeah, um, I think I think we need to look at the planning system, sort of stand back, which is pretty much what Ewan was saying yesterday, and think how much of this is just bureaucratic process, because all of that could be automated. Um, you look at the GPDO, um, the, the General Management Procedure Order, I think about 80% of it is just process. That could mm. all be automated eventually. Yeah. And it would be a quite a simple automation as well. And then you've got the more tricky stuff, which is the evidence, the ecological evidence, the population evidence, the air quality evidence. Eventually, that could all be automated too, or not so much automated as produced by automated techniques. Yeah. And that's yeah. the area where I think we're going to see the most growth as we get things like 5G coming through, um, the ways of of taking data from our environment are going to become much more sophisticated and much more immediate and that will feed through in a much more dynamic way into planning applications that's where i think the growth and the excitement is going to be and then the final area which is the one that the machines i don't think will ever do is what i would call human discretion um, machines already struggle with trees just as pure images um, I went to a, a, a planning hack at the Turing and they had this brilliant, they were trying to map Cambridge and they would have a thing that said tree, 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 broccoli, because it, it just hadn't recognised the tree as anything other than something green and kind of, you know, can, you know green and growing. Um, that's just how a tree looks. If you think about the emotions connected with a tree for a particular community, only a body of humans could really ever assess what the loss of that tree might mean. Um, and there's a whole wealth of planning that is that kind of evaluative, sophisticated judgment that machines, well, there's no point in making them do it. They simply are not that complicated because they, they're not, they just don't have as many connections in their brains as we do. So with that kind of in mind, it leads to the obvious next piece, which is, OK, so if planners are stopping doing all of the process driven elements of the role mm. and they're only left with the qualitative elements of the role, how do you think we're going to have to train planners differently coming into the industry? Um, well, I think you could do you could do a number of things if you were a planner now. You could. Um, you could learn to code, and that was something that Ewan was talking about yesterday. Um, you'd be much better off, I think, um, looking at what these new technologies are, what the opportunities are, um, and maybe doing some stats because they really, predictive algorithms work on stats. And if you don't understand stats as a, a, as a, a planner, then you're going to have a real problem trying to explain predictability to a group of members. I know that's not one something I think most people went to university to do planning, not to do maths, but stats and data science, unfortunately, it's one of the things in the future. But actually, there's also going to be a huge role for planners to translate this scary new technological world into the public, to educate the members, to educate the public. To show them the benefits of it, to explain these sort of terms, um, and to deal with one of the equalities issues, which is digital discrimination. There is always going to be a need for somebody to be there to talk to people who don't have access to a computer or don't want to use a computer and make sure that they are also fully involved. Is, are there kind of human rights issues that then relate to that as well? Yeah. Um, I, Try not to bore everybody too much on this front, but it's a massive area, not yet in planning. Um, but there was a case last year, Mr. Bridges, 
Bridges, which many people have probably forgotten about, where Mr Bridges took the South Wales Police to task for using um, automated facial recognition. And this yeah. um, was one of the huge issues that was considered that in that case was whether or not this was a breach of Article 8, which is the right to um, freedom of family life and protection of property. And um, they ruled that it, it both en it engaged that right and could also breach it. And in those cases, it was seen as justified. But would that also be seen as justified if a local authority approved something with automated facial recognition or just put it up in all the school gates? And that's exactly the kind of technology that might be brought forward over the next year. So because of because of the virus, um, you know, biometric sensing, temperature taking, pictures, all of that is the sort of things that will help us get through the epidemic. But they also have human rights issues attached to them that are already recognised by the English courts. So that's kind of quite terrifying, actually, because you're asking competing, you're, you're essentially arguing the greater good against... Um, the rule of law, in essence. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, it is a very complicated area. And you don't have to get it. You don't, the, the nice thing about, the, about planning is you don't have to necessarily fix the problem. But you do have to be say that you thought about it, just as you would if you were going to put an injunction on um, an encampment of travellers. You would not do that without thinking through the human rights implications. And you might still decide to make that injunction, but you wouldn't you wouldn't do it without considering those implications. And I'm saying that maybe this is the time to think about those implications for, for use of that sort of technology now. So you, when you spoke about kind of, you, you, I think the word, the phrase you used was risk matrix. Yeah. Um, can you just add a bit more meat on the bone? Because in essence, um, sorry, both of us coming from the legal mm. sector, kind of get that piece but um, I'm, I'm not sure the planning industry has ever yeah. had to think about risk matrices. matrices. Yeah. What would that really mean for a planning authority? Well it's sort of what I'm playing with it at the moment so it's not official or anything like that um, but say you wanted to put in a chatbot um, that's actually quite a sophisticated algorithm it's I think it's one based on neuro-linguistic programming yeah. so it's not one of the algorithms that you can easily explain so before you made the decision to adopt it, you might want to make sure that you would ask your supplier of the technology all the right questions. If you wanted to make a decision to formally use it, and sensibly that would be the way to go if you were going to start rolling it out through the local authority as a, as a service, then you might want to have a decision that said, these are the things we see that are risky. This is, these are the things that we see are benefits. This is what we're going to do to mitigate the risks. Um, things like third party rights of appeal, the access to a human if they need it, um, cyber security protection, it, all of those things. It is not rocket science, just what Ewan said yesterday. It's everything we've always done, but just applied to a different technology. And then after you've made the decision, you want to, might want to build in a review. You might want to check that your data is not being used in a biased way, though I, I can't think that it would be for that famous last words, um, or are the GDPR compliance still? And so it, it, that's exactly what I mean. It's just about thinking about it beforehand, making a conscious decision, and then reviewing it afterwards. So, so just to try and group some things together mm. uh, again, it, if the planning industry, and I think what your big message here was that we shouldn't, as an industry, walk into this blindly. Yeah. If we walked into it blindly what's the worst place we could end up what's the absolute backstop i think it would be i mean if if you know sort of the worst thing to do right now would be to introduce something like facial recognition technology and this is you know hypothesizing worst case scenario where you bought your data that had been where the data had been tagged by offshore and they weren't treating their employees well where it was where it had a discrimination bias baked into it so that it lets some people into the building and others not and there are cases where that's happened there was one where a gym um, didn't recognize a female going in because she was a doctor and it said only men could be doctors and that's what I mean about baked in discrimination like um, you, you can see that they be that kind of technology and then somebody would say well where's the decision 
who decided this? And then everybody was madly scrabbling for, well, you know, to find the minutes of the meeting. Um, and then, as, and then, you know, you might get a legal challenge, but you would have a horrible day in the press as well. And what a shame when that same technology could have been used to keep that particular premises safer or healthier. You know, not just a missed opportunity, but egg on the face. And then you put a whole load of other local authorities from trying it. You know, it's, yeah. it, that would be the worst case scenario that all of those things happen. So all of this is kind of based so the algorithms all seem to be based on data um so facts yeah. just using mm. terms trying to, i'm trying to construct construct some thoughts together here um the so if they're all based on data mm. is there then a risk around us starting to use data sets in planning that to date we've never gone with like post occupancy data so um, you and I both have, have, have no doubt argued with authorities in the past around um, how far morality is a material planning consideration or not, mm -hmm. uh, how far you can expect behaviours of, of occupiers of properties of any particular type to behave. Um, but if those then become data, does that become more dangerous or, or are we still going to have to write those sorts of things out of our algorithms? You can de-risk algorithms, and um, I'm trying to think of a way where a human. I mean, you, you're probably you're probably talking about the way that you would monitor, monitor something post occupation rather than make a decision based on it. As soon as you are recording and then making decisions based on human behaviour that has a sort of judgment attached to it, you are in really difficult ethical territory. Um, and you you know that I think. But along with the existing human rights, there are people talking and saying we should have a new human right of digital intrusion. And I'm beginning to think that might be a good thing to at least to recognise the concept of digital intrusion. Where is the point where there should be a kind of cyber wall as well as a brick wall between yeah. what you see and what you take into account? Um, God, you're really pushing me, David. That's the really ethical questions now. Um, there, it is, God, I hadn't even thought of that, but yeah. Human I'll, behavior is so important, I'll, isn't it? I'll keep you know, your brains another time on on um, the, the the work I want to do around um, digital ethics. So don't worry. Yeah. Um, ethics in the built environment data. Um, but I'm I'm just going to take us on to the to the last really big question that we've asked all mm. of our speakers, um, and we we're clearly going into some new unfounded times. Um, ahead of us. Um, we, we're using the word recession, we don't know whether that's the right word or the wrong word. Um, maybe let's call it challenging times for the, for the development mm. industry. Um, but we're really also very keen to support people still coming into the industry because one of our key learnings in the last couple of recessions has been around how we, the planning schools have closed down, it's been very hard for planners. What advice would you people people coming into our industry now about where we're going and what they need to do? Hmm. Um, I do think data science is probably something we can't ignore as a profession. Um, it's so key to everything not, and it, because it includes both the tech and the ethics. So start, I mean, just do something simple like signing up for the ODI seminars. They have free Friday seminars. Um, have a look at the updates from the Information Commission. Again, they've got loads of material, including the most difficult guidance I've ever read on data ethics, I have to say. But it's a good, they do have some really good guidance on, on AI, ethics and data, which is the kind of triangle of new things. Um, but you were saying to you and yesterday, you reckon this was your second recession, well, it's my fourth. Um, so ending on a very practical note, um, the first recession that I lived through was Mr. Pebbett telling us Northerners to get on our bikes. Um, so actually, as it turns out, that's what PFL is telling us as well. <laughs> so I do think it's kind of interesting that four recessions on, the answer is still get on your bike. But I would say get on your bike and get a 5G phone. There you are, they're my two top tips for the, for the, for the new age. 
That, that, that's really insightful. Um, so thank you so much for that. I have to admit that the, your, your presentation has triggered all sorts of thoughts in my mind and I continue to admire your, your, your vast ability to think better than I can. All um, of my teams in football teams, obviously. I was very gently trying to avoid that because anybody who knows me well will tell you me and football don't mix very well. Um, <laughs> but um, thank you so much for, for committing your time to, to doing this and I know it'd be really appreciated. Uh, we will be sharing the link to this talk because I think it's one of those that we'll keep coming back to because there's so much in it. Yeah. Um, and it's such a growing area. I'll be tapping you up again very shortly to, to Brilliant. Talk. Um, and, but the only other things that I'll say thank you to Lucy and Natalie for making all of this happen. Um, please do um, have a look at the YouTube channel. If you just type in YouTube and um, hash plan talk, um, you'll find um, all of the other videos for all of the events. Um, and the RTPI have still got an ongoing channel uh, table of events in this space as well. So thank you, everyone. And um, that's the end of today's session. Thank you.